sound better? Does that sound better? Uh, the angels are watching. Humanity is wondering. And then Jesus lowers himself through the social ladder. And the social ladder is very clear here. Divinity up on top, humanity, and then servanthood to the point of death. So that you have this ranking of which Jesus descends so that Paul says he does not grasp onto the privilege of being elite up on top, but he embraces the humiliation of being on the bottom rung for the sake of lifting up others. Those who place their faith in him will ascend into the presence of God. Now, contrast humility with its opposite, pride. So if you have humility on one side, you have pride on the other side. If humility is a descent towards the bottom of the barrel, then pride is a response to a social situation where it's self-elevation, and that's crucial. It's self-elevation up the social ranking so that you will be seen in a better light, admired, recognized for self-glorification. Now, this is the very first sin committed by Adam and Eve in the garden. So if you remember, Satan comes to Adam and Eve and says, look, uh, you're not enough. He's shaming them. You are not enough. You should be like God. In other words, rise up the social ranking. And they accept the challenge. They grab the fruit, and rest is history. But Adam and Eve's desire to ascend outward is a reflection of the very first sin in the cosmos. And that's when Lucifer looked at himself, saw himself, and said, wow, I'm here. I need to belong up there. And Isaiah 14 begins to describe this situation, what's happening in his heart, so that he says, uh, you, say, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. That's the angels of God. I will set my throne on high. See, this is the essence of pride. In a given social situation, right, the angels are all looking. Satan decides to climb the social ranking to the very throne of God so that he may be seen in the light of glory that he thinks he has by the other angels. And this is the key point. And because of his pride, his ascension up the ladder, he causes division. There's a split in the angelic world, in the creation of God, because pride always brings chaos into one's community. Civil war. C.J. Mahoney is a uh, pastor, pastor for a long time in Maryland, and I think he's correct when he writes, show me a church split, and I will show you a church that has tolerated pride. In every church conflict, somewhere in the background, there's always pride. John Stott writes that the essence of discipleship is twofold. Crucify pride, cultivate humility. That's it. He says in the next quote up there, at every stage of our Christian community or development and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is the greatest enemy and humility is our greatest friend. I think he's right. In fact, I know he's right. Because this is the number one struggle around, among the disciples. If you read Matthew and Luke and Mark and John, and you look at what is the struggle that the disciples had the most, it's pride. Remember that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and the disciples are going, and the conversation among them is, who is the greatest among us? Who is the one that is the highest up that everyone else ought to look up to? And Jesus spends most of his ministry with the disciples trying to cast out that attitude of pride and, and, and infuse a spirit of humility because he knows if there's one thing that will destroy the kingdom of God quicker than anything else, it's pride. You see it in James and John when they come to Jesus and, and they say, Lord, we want to sit in glory. We want to sit on your left side and we want to sit on your right side. What a request. And Jesus demurs and he says, look, it's not really up to me. But notice what it says about the rest of the disciples in the background. It says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. They're mumbling and whispering and criticizing. The seeds of division already planted. Wherever there is pride, there is division. Some of the most damning words God speaks in the Bible is against the arrogant of heart. 
So that if you look at Proverbs 6, everyone who is arrogant of heart is an abomination to the Lord. James simply puts it, God opposes the proud. In the next passage, God hates seven things. Very first on the list, haughty eyes or a prideful heart. Humility leads to unity. Pride leads to division. Let me ask a closing question then. How do you eliminate pride out of your life? Well, the answer to that question is the same as the question, how do you cultivate humility? Because uh, it's a zero-sum game. It's sort of like a seesaw, right? Pride, humility, one goes up, the other goes down, one goes down, the other goes up. It's the same question. So I'm going to give you three quick suggestions. And it's not earth-shattering in any way. It's things that you may be practicing even now, but hopefully more intentionally. So there are three things to practice in order to cultivate humility. First, remember from where you came from. There should be a regular practice of our spiritual discipline to remember how lost we were, how blind we were without the grace of God. It is worth pointing out in the first three chapters, right, the theological side, there's only one command. You know that? There's only one command in the first three chapters, the theological side, and it's the verb to remember. Remember where you came from, that you were separated from Christ, alienated from the kingdom of God, strangers to the promise, having no hope and no God. Because the more you remember where you came from, the more you will remember the grace that was poured out to you in such a way to restore you where you are. You know, when I read through the scriptures, how many times God says, remember, remember. He says to the Old Testament saints, remember. So, you know, whenever they encounter God, they build these altars because they're memorials. They remember. Whenever Israel encounters the power of God, they build these memorials because they want to remember. Every first Sunday when we participate in communion, we are remembering where we once were and how much God has poured out his grace to restore it. There is nothing like remembering the cross to strike down the pride and fill us with humility. When I was uh, first ministry out in California, we had the staff meeting, I still remember, and there were about 20 of us there, and the senior pastor went around and said, I want you to name your favorite hymn. And uh, I still remember the one that we sang this morning, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the, on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but lost and pour contempt on all my pride. Nothing like reflecting on the cross to pour contempt on my pride and to be filled with humility. Second is to pray. If humility is a confession of our weakness, that we are unable in our own strength, then prayer is a sign that we are relying upon God. And the more we pray, the more we are humble. That's why in Ephesians, prayer is so emphasized. So that when we get to chapter 6, and Paul is headed to the climactic moment of the letter, he says, look, this is a spiritual battle. You can't use physical weapons. You need spiritual weapons. And so he's starting to list them. You know, the belt of truth and breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, the sword of his word. And in the very end, he says, I want you to pray at all times. It's not part of the armor. It's the glue that keeps the armor together. And a church that prays is a humble church. A church that prays is a united church. You know, if I were to evaluate as a church consultant the health of a church, I would not look at its attendance or its budget or its programs. I would join the congregational prayer. It's one of those things where you can actually number because the more people come out intentionally to pray, that's a sign of humility within the church. I've been in churches where in the prayer meeting you had less people than Sunday school for a church well over a thousand. That tells us something about where our heart is. 
And then lastly, and this is the one that's the easiest to practice, well, easiest in the sense of doing it, it's to be grateful, to be grateful. The humble person is grateful for every blessing because he doesn't see himself as, as having deserved anything that he received. I find this in the letter to Paul, uh, letters of Paul constantly, as he's writing the letters to the churches, he's always saying, look, I'm so thankful for you, I'm so grateful for you, including the church in Corinth, which has given the most headache. A church that's full of division, read it, because it's full of pride, it's filled with division. And there's immorality that will make the Gentiles blush. Members are suing each other. They're saying, look, my spiritual gift is better than yours. They're trying to ride up the social ladder using God's gift. They're getting drunk during communion. And Paul says, I give thanks to my God always for you. I find that amazing. If I was a pastor of a church like that, man, I'd be complaining all the time. I'd be so frustrated and I'd be so sour. And Paul says, man, I thank God for you every single moment. And I think it's because Paul understood that he never got this position by interviewing for it or because he had the CV that was amazing. He disconnected this church from a sense of who he was and he said, God, you gave it to me by your mercy. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. I love that last phrase. We do not lose hope. That's become my motto. We do not lose hope. We do not lose hope. Because it's not in my ability, not in my strength. So I thank God for all that he is doing, whether I can see it or not. We do not lose hope. You know, for Paul, I think he sees the congregation members as sheep, and then Jesus is the pastor. Then who is Paul in this imagery? He's the sheepdog. I like that. He's the sheepdog. What's the job of a sheepdog? Not to change the life of the shepherd. You just run around and keep people near the shepherd because the shepherd will heal. The shepherd will carry. The shepherd will encourage. My job isn't to change your lives. Neither are the deacons, the elders, or the pastors of this church. It's to keep people close to Jesus. If I can keep you close to Jesus long enough, sooner or later, he will have his way with you. You know, Paul is one of the most humble people in Scripture because he's always remembering where he came from. I was the worst sinner of all. He's always praying. And he's always giving thanks. I'm going to end with this really last quick thought. You know, grateful people are joyful people. Grateful people laugh a lot because uh, humble people... Do not believe they deserve they receive whatever they receive. And so everything in life is a gift. You know, it's sort of like getting up in the morning. Boy, I was almost tempted to buy a lottery ticket when it went above a billion dollars, but, you know, I refrain. But if you're a humble person and you're filled with gratefulness, every morning you get up is like winning the lottery. Oh, God, I just get to breathe. You know, let's just start there. And then start with God. He's going to meet my daily bread. He's going to watch over me. I get to talk and enjoy people. I have a calling to carry out. You know, grateful people are joyful people because everything in life is a gift. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we are so grateful for the cross and the presence of the cross. Father, by the mercies you have shown us, we are humbled at heart. May you break any sense of pride that is within us so that we may become a church that is united, united in such a way that there's a love that flows out and we submit to each other. Whatever differences there may be, as my brother Dan prayed, whether it's skin color or, or differences in theology or politics or socioeconomic, it doesn't matter because the one God is far greater than all the differences that may be found in this church. May we become a great church because we love you and we love each other and there's nothing we won't do for you and for each other. Amen. Let us rise.